If you know the Lord will provide, say amen. amen. If you know that he'll heal you, say amen. amen. You know, we're a church that believes in healing. You know, I often go into a hospital, and I've done it a number of times. I don't always do it. I have to feel like doing it. I have to feel led to do it. I can't do it in the flesh. And I say, I didn't come to fellowship with you. I came to bring you a healing. And I want to tell you this. Listen up. You with me? You're, you're here and you're under this ministry, under our pastors and under myself and Pastor Sandra and all this great leadership team. Believe in God for things. Believe in God for your healing. Faith comes by healing, hearing, hearing by the word of God. So believe in God for things that other places may not teach you to believe. Because if you are in that hospital bed and you haven't sat under, sat under a word of faith, then I don't have a hook to hook into. I'll come in talking about faith and you'll be blank. And when you're blank, I'll know, doesn't matter what I think, matters what's inside that brother right there, what's inside that sister. It doesn't mean that it's a perfect formula. I don't know. I just know that the word works. And I know that there's people in here that's been healed. I know I have. And I know I walk in healing. You know, there's divine healing and there's divine health. Amen? So I like both of them. I like to walk in divine health. And if I slip up in there, I'm glad I got some divine healing, right? Amen. But God heals. Believe in God for things. Trust in Him. Because He's big God. He's a big God. So don't get comfortable in just, you know, just life. Life is too tough without God and what he promises, without our Holy Spirit power, you know, and understand what we're about. We're the church, and we're about eternity. We're about something that everybody else isn't about. We're about eternal life. We're about getting it and doing something with it while we're here. Amen? I sure love you. Thank you, Lord, for this day and for this privilege. Thank you for your word. Let it be seed into good ground. Somebody say, I'm good ground. Well, say it like you mean it. I'm good ground. Well, this is good seed. It's the word of God. Let me read from Ephesians chapter 2. And you're probably very shocked that I'm not preaching from my book today. I know that's going to be something, right? What? I'll, pre I'll preach from this book. This is the best book. Ephesians 2, let me start in verse 1, and we'll get down to where we're going in just a few verses. I love this. And you, talking about you, how many of you know the Bible talks about you? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit, small s, of the spirit, that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we were among them. Look what we were among. We were among them. We were among those people who were dead in trespasses and sins, walking according to the course of this world, walking according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. We were them. We were them. Among them, we too... Formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That's who we were. That's the way you were born. You were born into this world like that. You were born into a carnal, rebellious, Adamic nature. Your brother Adam sinned, and he lost his inheritance, and he happened to lose yours for you. He did that for you. I mean, even though sin does things to you. And that's what opened up the door. You know, Adam and Eve were doing fine in paradise. And they were doing the work of God. The Lord said, I want you to take over. He gave them the power and he gave them the assignment. Gave them the power to do it. And they were doing good. I can't imagine how much of the darkness they had pushed back over how long they had been doing the work that the Lord assigned them to do. Take over the world. Jesus said, don't make this a, mo a monastery, a model, 
I, I, I don't want this to be a place people come visit. This isn't a monastery. This is a model. Take over the world. Push back the darkness and the chaos of what the devil has done here. I want to set you down in here and you push it back. And I, can, I don't know how long they were there. How many years or decades? I don't know. But they were working. And I imagine when the Lord would come down in the cool of the evening, they would be excited to show him what they had accomplished. Look, look, Lord, we have pushed. This was formerly chaos and darkness, and we've pushed it back. We're fulfilling your assignment, and we've put light. There's light here now. There's order here now. Your kingdom is coming. Amen? They were doing that. They were busy about doing that. But they were under relentless pressure to violate the principles of God and disobey, and they did. And when they did, watch, things came into their lives that they had never experienced. Sin brings things into your life that you didn't intend to come in. And uh, Adam says, first of all, when the Lord asks him where he is, huh, he had never hidden from God before, but here's the thing. Sin will cause you to want to hide from God. Flee from God. And the Lord says, where are you? Well, let me tell you what. If the Lord ever asks you where you are, it isn't, it isn't because he doesn't know. Just in case. <laughs> he knows where you are. Oh, where are you? I don't know I'm God, but I, don't, I lost them on the radar screen. Don't think so. He just wants you to be aware that, that you're not where you ought to be. In other words, I know where you are, Adam, and you're not where you ought to be. And he said, I was afraid. There's the first thing that came into his life, that, that poured into his life when he opened the door to sin. He had never experienced fear. Eden had never experienced fear. Adam and Eve had never experienced because they were, birth, they were created in the very image of God and in innocence. And they had never experienced, I was afraid. There's the first thing that, flew, that opened the door and just poured in. Fear. Sin will pour fear into your life. I was afraid. And I was ashamed because I was naked. That's the, other, the second thing that will pour in with fear, it, with sin, is shame. Fear and shame. I was ashamed. They had never been ashamed. They were naked all of their existence and had no clue that there was something to be ashamed of. But sin poured in shame. Look, don't use the word shame in your vocabulary. Christians, don't, use, don't pick up a, a term of the world and say shame. Well, shame on you. Don't shame your kids and don't shame anybody because shame has poured in with sin. Eliminate that word from your, from your vocabulary. Act like when you go through the S's that that's not there. Amen. It's not a word in your vocabulary because, don't use, because sin poured, shame poured in with sin. Fear, shame, and blame. Watch what he did next. He said, the, uh, uh, the woman you gave me, <laughs> the woman you gave me. Now, first of all, he didn't blame God. First of all, he blamed Eve. But let me tell you what sin will ultimately do. No matter what happens in people's lives that are apart from God, they will ultimately blame God. I mean, the God that had given him all the paradise, Elder. I mean, he had poured him into paradise. Everything in the world that he could have ever wanted, poured it on him, put him in paradise. But God did this to me. You'll hear it all the time in this fallen society. When somebody falls or they fails, fail or something happens or not, they don't know God. Well, God, well, God did. Well, they've never, they've never messed with God before. But it's all of a sudden in their lives causing them this. I don't think so. Because how many of you know he's a good God? And he only means good for them. But he blames them. Blame. Fear, shame, and blame rushes in when the, when the door is crushed in out of sin and rebellion. Amen? So sin comes in. And, but what else comes in is redemption. <laughs> How many of you know wherever sin abounds, grace abounds greater? Amen? Sin, sin came in, but Christ came in. And there'd never been anything killed. There'd never been anything killed in Eden. Everything lived and it was wonderful. But, but, but Christ evidently led 
in killing an animal because they were dressed with the skin of animals. They weren't dressed with the fur or the, or, or the hair of animals. They were dressed with the skin of an animal. Something had died and blood had been shed. And the way out began immediately. And the very first prophecy, I'm preaching up in here now. Y'all not shouting as good as I'm preaching. But the very, the very first prophecy was birthed out of that. The very first prophecy of Christ, Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between you and the man, says to the devil. And here's what's going to happen. There's a seed born of a woman on the way. There's a, there's a seed born of a woman on the way, the first prophecy of Christ. And he and you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. First prophecy of Christ. So let me just tell you something about grace. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter where you think you are, there's always a way out. Grace always comes to offer you a way out. Aren't you glad that you accepted your way out? Did we get anywhere in uh, Ephesians 2 yet? And you were dead? Did we get that far? In your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of that, all the way down through there. And were by nature children of wrath, even but God. Say those two words with me. But God, but God, hallelujah. First two words of verse 4. But God being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Somebody say hallelujah. By grace you have been saved. And not of yourselves, right? By grace you have been saved. And he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Woo! He redeemed you and elevated you, right? Notice how God redeems us and rescues us and cleanses us. That's who you were. That's not who you are anymore. So look, don't just be an old sinner saved by grace. Get that term out of your mouth too. Well, you know, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, you were an old sinner and you have been saved by grace, but now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are blood washed. He has made you righteousness. He has been made unto you righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He's been made that to you and that's who you are. You may not be perfect in it, but he, you, you are perfect in it because he made, he made you that way. He rescues us, scrubs us with his blood, cleanses us, washes behind your nasty ears. Redeems us. Somebody say amen. amen. And moves us into a relationship with himself. He moves us into this relationship with himself. He made us alive. And moved us into a relationship with himself. He gave us his life. He gave us his breath. He gave us his blood. And moved us not into religion. But into a relationship with himself. Somebody shout amen. amen. And immediately. Watch what happens in verse 6. Immediately. The Bible says. And seated us in, with him in, heaven, in the heavenlies. He seated us in Christ in the heavenlies. Immediately. Without asking. Without a conference. Without a vote. He didn't ask a church full of people, do you think they're worthy? Because how many of you weren't worthy? And the church wouldn't have been the, fir would have been the first to know it. <laughs> Not worthy. <laughs> You're seating him where? <laughs> Amen. We're going to have 10 people come across here this morning. We're going to vote if they're worthy to be seated. And the whole church would go, I don't think so. And I know them. I know them since they've been saved and they're not worthy. So that, aren't you glad there wasn't a vote on you? Uh, there was only one vote and Christ gave the vote on you. Amen. Without asking, without a conference, without even asking you. On his own initiative. He seated you and he elevated you into a high place with him. Into a high place. Now you are there. You're there. Didn't ask you. Well, I'm not good enough, Larry. Didn't, didn't do that. Wasn't on that grounds. Because of his grace. 
He didn't give you time to deserve it. He didn't give you time to paint some house or take a widow a pie. Immediately when he redeemed you, boom, he elevated you. Everybody go, boom, he elevated you. Boom, boom he elevated you. <laughs> Amen? Into high places, into the throne seat with Christ. You know what verses 4 and 5 are? Verses 4 and 5, let me read them. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our transgressions made us alive together, by grace we have been saved. You know what that is? That's the event. Verses 4 and 5 is the event. Think about life like this a bit from time to time. Verses 4 and 5 is the event. Verse 6 is the purpose. I've come to realize in life recently that most every event, most every important event anyway, is there for a purpose. An event is there for a purpose. Hmm. Think about it. Ecclesiastes 3, 1, the King James says something like this. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. There's an event... But the event needs to be followed because it's there for a purpose. The event may not take long, but the purpose may take a lifetime. The events in your life may, may happen just boom immediately. But the purpose of that event, the reason the Lord did it, may take a lifetime. Hmm. Amen? What about the event at Pentecost? 50 days after the resurrection, we're coming to the Sunday of Pentecost when they were all gathered in that upper room and the Holy Spirit poured out Christ inside, filled them all with himself. They'd been following him on the outside, right? They were carnal. They were fleshly. They didn't understand. And boom, everybody say it. Boom. All of a sudden, this is a boom Sunday, so come on. All of a sudden, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The Christ they had followed on the outside moved in. That was the event. But if there would have been a bunch of charismatics, they would have never left the upper room. They would have just been comparing tongues. Hey, listen to this one. Yeah, but listen to this one. Yeah, no, 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 mama. Yeah, right. They've been just comparing gifts and comparing, been up there comparing. That's not what the event was about. I thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. But the event isn't about it. The event has a purpose. And the purpose was to get them downstairs, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking languages they had never learned, bringing thousands of people to Christ. It was the purpose. And that purpose has lasted forever. Until now, that purpose is still going on. The event of Christ moving you, convicting you, moving into you, washing you, cleansing you, is an event but it isn't something you just dwell there and talk about and look at and paint. The event is there for a purpose. Christ saved you for a reason. Amen. I'm working up here and you know I'm a little older than I used to be when I did this four times. So come on here. Christ, Christ saved you for a purpose. Right? Pentecost. What was the purpose of Pentecost? Souls. Right? 3,000 souls that very day. 5,000 later. And the church birthed. The church, this right here, continues to be the purpose of that event. Amen. We live in the purpose of that event. The event. Your wedding ceremony. My event. Mine and Sandra's event. The wedding ceremony. The purpose was to change me. Still going on? <laughs> Say, well, Larry, you know, you're quite a mess. Yeah, but you should have seen me before Sandra got a hold of me. I'll tell you what. Right? <laughs> that was the event. Now, I want to tell you something. You, all of you people that say, oh, oh you, you don't, you can't, you know, it'd be nice if we could just cel celebrate forever around the cake. <laughs> right? Oh, we had a wedding cake. Yeah, but it's 40 years ago, baby. That cake is old. 
Yeah, but we got a refrigerator, throw it away, doesn't matter. That was the event. There has to be some purpose beyond it. There has to be a marriage. There has to be a merger. There has to be a testimony. There has to be something beyond the event. Amen. It's good, isn't it? I've learned that most every, every event is there for the purpose. Your salvation, of course. The event is to elevate you into his changing power. Into his changing power. Are you with me? Well, he elevated me into the very throne. That was the event. What he did with you in Ephesians 2 was elevate you, saved you. It's an event. Elevated you, brought you up, set you in his chair. That's the event. What was, what was the purpose? So you could enjoy the view? <laughs> Woo. I've never seen it like this from up here. Pretty nice. Right? So we could lean back in our reclining throne chair and relax? The answer is no. It's rhetorical, but it's no. Everybody say it, no. So we would embrace ownership. Here's the purpose, that we would embrace ownership. He, we, the event of being elevated is so we could see what we own. So we would feel like and live like and perform like sons rather than slaves. Amen. There's a verse there in Galatians 4, 7. You with me? Galatians 4, verse 7. Let me read it to you as you see it on the screen probably. They couldn't believe it when I gave them two verses today. Back in the booth. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir through God. You're no longer a slave. You've been elevated into the throne so that you are no longer, understand that you're a son and you're not a slave. And you own it. So we would feel like and live like and act like sons. So we would embrace ownership of kingdom things and be partners with God in accompanying his design and desires in the earth. God has relegated his success. Oh, I got stuff to say to you today. God has relegated his success on the earth to partnership with his sons. With us, we're the children. And he has, he has relegated his success. Whatever he does in the earth, he must do it and will do it through his church. Think about that statement. All of the above is true. It's a fact. What he's done for you. It's throne room truth. You're accepted and trusted and entrusted and elevated. Amen? I know we're doing really good with the privilege. <laughs> you know what's about to say here, huh? We love to wallow in the privilege. Woohoo, I'm seated with Christ in the heavens. Woohoo, you ain't never seen nothing like this. Watch this. Woo, it's the, it's the armchair. It swirls. Woo, it swirls, right? But, but the president of the corporation go walk in with a folder, and in the folder is going to be your assignment. And in the folder is going to be your assignment. How are we doing with the assignment? I know how we're doing with the privilege. Woo, wee. Right? Like, like the marriage. What? Wee. Woo-hoo. Honeymoon is over. <laughs> right? <laughs> Honeymoon cake. Oh, they sang my favorite song. Oh, over. Amen. There, you know what? You don't need to leave that towel there, Larry. Over. <laughs> and, and Larry, you know, I love you, baby, but I ain't picking it up. <laughs> Over. <laughs> Great privilege, man. We, we went through the honeymoon. Some of you will get it. That's a drink of water work. 
How many of you know marriage hits? And you have to work out the purpose of the event. It's a great purpose. But many marriages fall apart because they only experienced an event and didn't realize there was a purpose to make us better, to build, to build relationship, to be responsible. When Christ honored us by way of invitation and eleva elevation into his tr throne, into his dominion, into his authority, he inherently entered, we inherently entered into the responsibility of his mission. He imputed to us ownership. Therefore, the responsibility of kingdom expansion is mine and yours. To sit in Christ's throne is to see his world and to feel his heart. Elevation impacts your worldview. Now you overview the world like Christ. Do you see those hungry children in Guatemala from here? Do you see the homeless in Haiti? Are you looking at the drug infested situation across the tracks in Titusville? You have a changed worldview. It's impacting to see the world from Christ's point of view. Amen? You with me? Elevation impacts your priorities. To embrace a throne worldview is to deny yourself more than ever. To set with Christ is to be released from self centered, self serving ways. It is to join Christ in his mission. Throne elevation changes my mission. It moves me from a mission that serves and centers around me to a mission that serves and centers around what Christ sees and desires. I see it from here. I see it from here. Amen. Amen. You have ownership. You know what I want you to do? I want you to take ownership of this ministry. Well, you know, y'all's church is a nice church. Don't say that to me. It's your church. This isn't y'all's church. This is your church. Say it, my church, my church. My church. Is it your church? Answer me. Is it? Well, pick up the paper. Pick up the paper. What, 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 take, take a paper towel, gentlemen, and wipe, wipe down the, the counter when you wash your hands. And it wouldn't be bad for some of you guys to learn to flush the t toilet. Sometimes I walk in there, it's like, holy smoke. <laughs> I hope you don't live like that at home. Well, no, I don't, but the home is mine. This is yours. Own it. Well, we just attend here. Do something more than that. Own it. This is, this is eternity. Boy, this is good preaching, I tell you what. I wasn't planning on preaching this good. Shoot. Huh? It's something how ownership change, shapes your attitude toward the, the, the things you own, when you own it. Did you ever wa wash a rental car before you took it back? Probably not. You barely got gas in it. Usually I don't. They charge me a whole lot more, right? Oh, I forgot. Well, we'll charge you for that. Yeah, I'm sure you will. You know? It don't matter sometimes. You, you, I look at rental cars and somebody's drug their luggage across the bumper. And, and very nice cars at one time, not old, but they're just scratched all over the bumper. You, I would ne you'd never do that with, with your car. But you just don't cherish it because you don't own it. You're going to turn it in. Let me tell you something, friends. You ain't going to turn this in in a week or two. You're not going to turn Christ in in a day or two. This is eternal, man. This is forever. This is about eternal life. And we own it. And he seated us there. So we can see things from his point of view. So his heart can affect our heart. So his view can affect our view. So his passion can affect our passion. Anybody hearing me today? Are you with me? So you own it. You embrace it. You embrace Christ. Be elevated. He, did, he didn't ask you. You are. You're elevated into his position. Seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Pretty neat, isn't it? Yes. Not because you deserve it, because you don't. But he just has you. He just has you there. Has me there with you. We're all there. We're all seeing. 
we're all observing, we're all doing differently than we ever did because we know the mission. We see the need. Somebody clap your hands for the glory of God. Amen. Sure love you. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you for being here. Across the media, you ought to be here. Amen. Because this is your church. Amen. You know, we go to funerals sometimes or at weddings and you see people that used to be here and they're nowhere. That's sad. You know, if they're somewhere, it's all right. We, we put a lot of good members in other churches. <laughs> I don't get a lot of thank yous from pastors for that, but we have. We've put a lot of good members in other churches. But God bless them, they're in church. But a lot of people just aren't. Out of COVID. We, we stopped going to COVID. We just practice our faith at home. I doubt it. Not much. You'll die and go to heaven. But you ain't seeing things like you ought to see them. If you aren't hearing the word of God. Amen. Get your children. I tell you what. Every, every parent that has a teenager ought to have that teenager in a youth ministry. And this is not a bad one. Let me tell you, it's a great one right over here. Well, I speak healing to you. I speak faith to you. I speak salvation to your family. And I speak strength to you, Carol Henry, in the name of Jesus. And I speak a, a, a healed heart for you, Dean. For your heart to be healed, man. You're my covenant friend. And for you, in every place of need in your life, that the Lord fills you up and you realize who you are in Jesus Christ. Amen.